I don't have to tell any of you, I don't think I do, I hope not, that there's a war going on between Israel and her enemies, and it's been going on for weeks, months, and years. And her enemies have sworn the complete desolation and annihilation and elimination of the nation of Israel to the west, Hamas in Gaza, to the north, in Syria and Lebanon, you got Hezbollah. To the south, you have the Houthis in Yemen. And of course, the big one, Iran, who's behind all the efforts of all of these other uh, vicious, vicious people that are coming against Israel. And every one of them have vowed the destruction and elimination of Israel. You may say, I wonder why? What's, what's this war really all about? I mean, after all, Israel's a little bitty place. It's not a big country, and they got all these many, many miles and miles of country in there under their control. Why would they want this little tiny country? It is about the land of Israel. It's about the city of Jerusalem even more so. And then the pinpoint is the Temple Mount. So you can just kind of see it focusing down to the bullseye, to the Temple Mount in the city of Jerusalem. It's so very, very important to them. Why? Why is it so important to the Jews that the Temple Mount be preserved and kept in their hands? You go back and look at the history and you will find in your Bible that Father Abraham was led to offer up his son Isaac to that one exact spot. God stopped him before he could kill his son, but he gave us a great lesson about a father being willing to sacrifice his son where God himself has sacrificed his own son. Amen. So it's very important. It was there that David said, we need to build a temple right here on top of Mount Moriah. He bought it as a threshing floor. He said, we're going to build a temple here. God wouldn't let him build it. He let his son Solomon build it. And the first temple was built right where the Temple Mount is today. There's a gold dome Muslim mosque there today where the temple used to stand. So it's very important to the Muslim people. In their history, they believe that Muhammad went to heaven one night on a horse and came back with the Koran to that very spot. So to the Muslims, they want that spot. You can see why. You can see why Israel wants that spot too because that's where the first temple was, the second temple, and where the third temple shall be built. They want to keep that one spot. But it's about more than just geography. It's about the gods that they worship. The Muslims worship a god they call Allah. And He is designed and He is displayed in the Koran as to what He is supposed to be like. And He's not anything like the God of the Bible. Amen. The God of the Bible is a God of great love who sacrificed His own Son for us. And so there's a huge conflict, each side saying, you're worshiping the wrong God. Your God hates our God. And so therefore we should hate you. And yet they chase their history all the way back to Abraham. Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. And Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And you find the history of the Israelites coming through Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. And then the rest of the Arabs in that part of the world can trace their ancestry back to Abraham too. A lot of them can, most of them can. But they go back tracing their ancestry back through Esau, the Edomites. You find them in the Bible in the land of Edom on the eastern side of the Dead Sea and the country of Jordan. And they trace ancestry back to Ishmael. So you see that at one point they had the common father, if you will, of Abraham. And they said, see, God made promises to Abraham. And so we inherited those promises. But they are fighting. And the question is, will Israel survive? Is Israel going to survive? If you ask any uh, number of military analysts, and they start counting up the numbers on the armies on both sides. <laughs> there's no way. I mean, there's, there's no way Israel can. I mean, they're outnumbered all the way around. Every one of their enemies outnumbers them. And then they look at the armament that they have, the number of missiles and rockets and, 
anti-tank guns and everything else that they've got. They said, oh no, there's no way Israel's going to survive this one. And they say, well, Israel must have some pretty strong allies. So let's check with the UN. That's not an ally. The UN has been against Israel from the start. The UN is telling Israel, and the United States has said the same thing, you need to have a peace treaty. Cease fire. Quit shooting at Hamas. Quit shooting at Hezbollah. Quit shooting at the Houthis in South Yemen. Quit, quit, quit attacking those who attacked you. They don't ever say it to the other guys. They never tell them to have a ceasefire. It's always just Israel. Stop, stop, stop. Can Israel possibly win against the enemies who have attacked her again and again and again throughout all of her history? From that insert you've got in your bulletin, please take that home and read about it and pray over it. You get a better picture of what's going on because one year ago tomorrow, October the 7th, 2,000 Hamas terrorists came across the border from Gaza. Now you understand that the Gaza Strip was given to the Palestinian people by Israel. Israel owned it. They didn't sell it. They gave it to them. And they gave them all kinds of supplies and all kinds of medicine, all kinds of food, and to enable them to establish a country there. And they even kept the gates open so they could come in and out of Israel and work in Israel and earn money and go back there. And yet, here's where the enemy came from. Out of Hamas territory, it came out of Gaza. And one week ago tomorrow, when they came through on that morning, they massacred, they tortured, they raped, they burned alive 1,269 men, women, and children down to infants. Slaughtered a baby in front of their mother's eyes and then raped and killed their mama. This is the kind of people Israel is dealing with. And the celebration was taking place throughout the Muslim world. Oh, we're finally getting Israel. They were celebrating this horrible, horrible massacre that was taking place. On that very day, they fired 5,000 rockets into Israel. And of course, since then, many thousands more but that's just coming in from the west, from the Mediterranean Sea. And, and what about the Hezbollah? We've been hearing a lot about Hezbollah lately and about the war going on there. They were cheering on Hamas, and they were wanting to see how well Hamas could penetrate Israel's defenses. So they, they sat back, and they watched, and they cheered. And then they said, we don't have anything to cheer uh, they, because Israel drove them out. But, and Israel began to slaughter them as they went one day after another. So Hezbollah fully supported Hamas, and, and in the process they were examining their own plan, saying, how can we do that only better? So they found recently on the drawing board that Hezbollah was planning an identical attack coming from the north out of Lebanon tomorrow. Tomorrow. You may remember if you paid attention to the news, all that was going on about how they were killing off the Hezbollah leaders. Israel was finding them and, and assassinating them for good reason. They were planning the destruction of Israel. They were amassing thousands of troops to come across the border. They were amassing thousands upon thousands of rockets and missiles which they'd been steadily firing. They were ready to come. And that was their plan to come into northern Israel and take over, take control of that country. You might remember the pagers that they had. That's absolute brilliance. Who would have thought, let's give them pagers so they can contact each other and then we'll push the button and blow them all up. That's what they did. Thousands of them. And so they got comfortable with that and so the, uh, the Hezbollah soldiers said, man, we get to, well, I don't want any pager, man. <laughs> get rid of that. We got to contact each other some other way. So they issued walkie-talkies. Remember what happened to the walkie-talkies? They blew them up the next day with them in their hands. And they couldn't figure it out. Hezbollah said, I don't understand how they're doing this to us. How are they so smart? They got wisdom from Almighty God. That's how smart they are. That's where the wisdom came from. So that's what's been taking place. And, and of course, all that is being backed by Iran. And then we mentioned the Houthis. They're way down there in South Yemen. They're way down there. Look at you, the tip of, of the continent there, the Red Sea. And they got mad because 
Hamas lost. And so they said, well, we're going to attack Israel too. And so they fired long-range missiles, hypersonic missiles, headed for Tel Aviv. Didn't do any damage. But they made the Israelis mad enough that a couple of days ago, they went and wiped out about a half a dozen of their positions, the rocket firing stations, ports. They said, we've had enough of this. The Houthis even so bold that they were, they were attacking shipping all through the Red Sea area. And if you're familiar with the map, you can see that all the shipping had to go right by their country to go around the Horn to go up into the Persian Gulf over to uh, Iran and other countries. But they were trying to sink the ships. They even fired on our military, our Navy ships. And when that happened, I said, I don't hear us firing back. Something's wrong here. <laughs> well, they have since fired back. It's quite a war. Israel and the U.S. have retaliated against them, and they're not through. April the 13th of this year, Iran had a major attack on Israel. 180 ballistic missiles, 170 drones, 30 cruise missiles, all firing one right after another. They said, we will absolutely overwhelm the Israeli defense. They didn't. Oh, they overwhelmed a lot of it. They overwhelmed David's sling and Iron Dome, but that's not their big defense. God's their big defense. And they didn't overwhelm him at all. Not one Israeli was killed. Not one. They had no other explanation. We don't understand. We fired so many missiles and so many rockets, and we're, nope, we didn't do any damage. What's wrong? They said, found that many of them, they went up and came right back down on their own country. And, they landed in crazy places. A lot of them went completely overhead over the city of Haifa, uh, out into the Mediterranean Sea. I guess they killed some fish out there. I don't know. But they must not have been Jewish fish because God protected his people. And that's just a little humor on my part. Not one Israeli was killed. And you know, when we think about the nation of Israel, say, must be a powerful nation. They must be big and strong. Look at them on a the map. You, you, you measure the size of Israel, the entire nation of Israel, and lay it down beside a map of Louisiana. And you're going to find that Louisiana is six times the size of Israel. You could put Israel into our state six times. It's a little tiny, tiny country. And yet all of these Muslim nations are wanting to destroy that little tiny country. Well, they tried in April and were not successful. And so October the 1st this year, I mean just a few days ago, they fired 181 ballistic missiles out of Iran this time. Most of those were intercepted by the aero defense system which kept, caught those that were coming in out of the stratosphere, completely out of the atmosphere. And then David's sling was catching those that were coming in at a lower altitude, and the Iron Dome was catching those that were coming in at a lower altitude than that. And the United States, we, we had some warships in the Mediterranean Sea, and we were shooting down some of them too. How many Israelis were killed in that time? Can you imagine 181 ballistic missiles? Not one. Not one Jew was killed. None. How do you explain that? That type of devastation coming through the air, through all the defense systems, and some of it was hitting the ground, yes, and much of it was going into the sea, but that which was hitting the ground, nobody was killed. Well, it destroyed a few buildings, but nobody was killed. October the 1st was the eve of the Yom Kippur, the Jewish holiday their new year. The Jews were celebrating. <laughs> I guess they were. There is no other explanation except God is protecting His people as He said He would. Amen. It doesn't matter how old God's promise is, it's still true. Amen. It's true today, it'll be true tomorrow, it shall forever be true. I don't know. I don't know what's coming up next, but I do know what has come up in the past. Let's look at the scriptures. Let's see where God promised His people He would take care of them, okay? 
Start with me in the book of Genesis. Yeah, I know we're going to be here for a little while, but it's all right. It's important. Let's see what God promised to his people through Abraham, the father of the nation. In Genesis chapter 12 and verse 2, of course, he was named Abram at this point before God changed his name. He said, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. Amen. Wow! When Almighty God says that, you better be sure you're on the right side. You better be one of those who are blessing Israel every way you possibly can. And even if all it is, I'm praying for peace in Jerusalem. I'm praying for Israel like we did this morning. I suggest you do it every day. He said, I'm going to bless those that bless you and I'll curse those who curse you. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God was telling Abraham, even though Abraham didn't know it, God was telling him about Jesus. All of the nations of the world have been blessed through the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord Jesus Christ is the descendant of Abraham. Amen. Okay? God always keeps His Word, even when we don't understand it. So that's the first one. That's the second time He promises to Abram in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 18. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed, your descendants, have I given this land. What land? He describes it. From the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river of Euphrates. Well, we figure the river of Egypt is pretty easy to find. It's in Egypt, right? I mean, it's right there. It's the Nile River in the river of Egypt. But well, what's the great river for Euphrates? Where is that located? If you start looking at that river on a map, it begins way up in Turkey and meanders down through Syria and comes down through Iraq and goes into the Persian Gulf. And right before it gets to the Persian Gulf, the eastern shore is Iran. And you've got Kuwait is right there too. You see that on a map? God said, Abram, all this land belongs to you. Everything between the Egyptian River and the great river Euphrates belongs to your descendants. They've never claimed it. All that belongs to them. All they're wanting to claim is that little piece of land they got right now that's one sixth the size of Louisiana. But God says, I got a lot more for you, and the day's going to come that you're going to get to have it all. It belongs to you. And then he says in the eighth verse, if you'll look on that in the 17th chapter, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. The Canaanites lived there. That was the people that lived in that land at that particular time. This is the land of the Canaanites. Well, who was Canaan? Canaan was the grandson of Noah. Noah had sons, and one of them named Ham, and one of his sons was Canaan. And his descendants were the Canaanites. So that's how you get the name Canaan. And there's the land of the Canaanites. As a matter of fact, when the Jews were coming out of Egypt, they were referred to as the Canaanite people. All the land of Canaan is going to be your possession. How long? How long? Everlasting. There's no end to it. There's not going to come an end to this. God said this is going to belong to you forever. And then he says, Oh my. Thy covenant will be established with Isaac in the 21st verse. He said, Abram, I'm establishing my covenant with you, but it's going to go through Isaac. Remember, he had two sons. Not going through the other one. Isaac. Now then, the third point where God makes a promise, this time is to Jacob, who is Isaac's son. So you got Abraham, grandpa, <laughs> and then Isaac, dad, and then Jacob, the son. And so here we find in Genesis chapter 28, verse 13 and 14, he said, I'm the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, or actually grandfather, and the God of Isaac, your father, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed, in thee and thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. He said, I'm going to give it to you, Isaac. I just want to reaffirm, it's not going through your brother, it's coming to you and your descendants, and all of the earth is going to be blessed. And again, that's a reference 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So it matters. It matters. Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. This is where Israel came from. Descendants of Jacob. God changed Jacob's name to Israel so that when today, when we think about Israel, we can trace it back to Jacob and trace it back to Isaac and trace it back to Abraham. And God's promise to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. He said, I am changing your name to Israel. Look a little bit farther down. Now we're going to go into Isaiah chapter 41. I'm going to give you a moment to turn there. And I'll get me there too. And we're going to find out more. Now this is, this is about a thousand years later, okay? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they've all gone to their graves. But here he's speaking to Israel, the nation of Israel, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 41, and verse 8. But thou, Israel, art my servant. These people, this nation of people, they're, they're my servants. They belong to me. Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend, thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called thee from the chief men thereof and said unto thee, Thou art my servant. I have chosen thee and not cast thee away. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. God said, look, don't be afraid of anything. I'm with you. Don't be get dismayed. I am your God. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. God is righteous. In other words, He's always telling the truth. He's always right. And you can count on God if He says that He's going to do it. And He said, I'm upholding you with the strong arm of my righteousness. You can trust me is what God's saying. He says, Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing and they that strive with thee, those that fight against you shall, what's the last word? Perish. That's what he says. Thou shalt seek them and shalt not find them. Even them that commanded, uh, contended with thee, they that war against thee shall be as nothing, as a thing of naught. So what's he saying? All of your enemies are going to be destroyed, Israel. You've got my promise. I'm the righteous God who never tells a lie. In my time, your enemies won't even be able to be found. Well, down through history, did he keep his word? Well, let's take a look. Back in that day, you started off with Assyria, the great Assyrian Empire. They're not anymore because they were conquered by the Babylonians. And the Assyrians had conquered part of Israel and the Babylonians conquered part of Israel, and they took it away from them, took them out of the land 70 years. But then the Medes came in, and they said, you need to go back to your land. They sent them back to the land. There's no Medes running around today, okay? The Persians, great Persian empire, it's gone. The Greek empire, it's gone. Oh, there's still a Greek nation, but no Greek empire. No, no, not like it was. The Roman empire... It's gone. They persecuted the Jews, something terrible. All these people did. That Nazi Germany, is there a Germany? Yes. Is there a Nazi Germany? No. It's gone. But see, the German people were not against the Jews. It was the Nazis. It was Hitler and his crowd. And they were the ones that tried to wipe out the Jews. God says, that's not going to happen. These are my people. They're going to suffer. They're going to go through a lot. But no. And now... The last one, the latest one, trying to annihilate the Jews is the nation of Iran. What do you think is going to happen to them? What God say? <laughs> They're going to become as nothing. <laughs> They're going to disappear off the face of the earth. Amen. So we're back to the original question. Will Israel survive this war? You've read what God said. Yes. I'm not worried about them losing the war. I'm really not. I just want to see how God's going to do it. We've already seen Him at work in some amazing ways 
in recent days. You say, well, I don't know. How do you, can, you, can you show me in the Bible somewhere that they're not going to lose this war? I sure can. I was hoping you'd ask. <laughs> Romans chapter 11. And I love this verse of Scripture because it talks about these wonderful people, God's chosen people. And my Savior was one of them. In His flesh, He was a Jew. Mary was a Jew. In His flesh, He was a Jew. God's chosen people. Romans chapter 11, verse 26 said, So all Israel shall be saved. Amen. Yeah. All Israel shall be saved. You say, well, what's that talking about? This is talking about the tribulation period, which is after the rapture of the church, when there's going to be seven years of tribulation, when the world is literally going to go to hell in that period of time. It is going to be terrible, destructive, and all the world's going to come against Israel. And they're going to be coming against Jerusalem. The armies are going to march. But God said, all Israel's going to be saved. They're going to be saved. And when Jesus returns, they're going to turn to Him and say, Oh, look on the one to whom we have pierced. Oh, He is our Savior. And they're going to be saved. They're going to be saved spiritually. They're going to be saved physically. God keeps His Word. Amen. God keeps His Word. He said, Are you sure? I'm going to give you one more verse and then I'm going to close. Back to the Old Testament, Zechariah. That's right before you get into the New Testament. Zechariah chapter 14. Jesus is coming back. He's going to rapture the church first. We'll be gone for seven years. And then we're coming back with Him. Look what happens. Zechariah 14 and 2, he said, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished, the half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when He fought in the day of battle. And His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. There will be a great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. And you shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach from Azel. Yea, you shall flee like you had fled before from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. Amen. How can the saints come with him? Easy. We've been raptured up. The saints of God, we're in heaven. And when he comes back, guess who's coming back with him? We're coming back. You say, oh, we're going to fight a battle. No, we don't have to fight a battle. No, we're just going to watch. And the Lord is going to have final, final victory. Oh, listen, all the nations are going to come against Jerusalem, but they're not going to defeat her because the Deliverer, <laughs> the Lord Himself, that will be there, the Deliverer. That's what it said. God is protecting His chosen people right now. Our Savior, the Lord Jesus, is protecting His people. They're going to be delivered by the Lord Jesus Christ. They already are. Many of them spiritually are. You and I can be delivered too. Maybe you're not in a war like they are fighting over there, but you're in a war. You're in a spiritual war. This world is a spiritual battlefield between good and evil, between God and the devil. And we're caught in the middle of that war. You better recognize it and figure out which side you're going to be on. Be on Abraham's side, I highly suggest. How does this really affect us? Does it, does it really, as Christians, why, why would we worry about this? How does this impact us? Well, let's focus on Jesus for just a moment. Where was Jesus born? In Bethlehem. Where is Bethlehem? In Israel. And where did He grow up? In Nazareth. Where is Nazareth? In Israel. Where was most of His ministry done? All throughout the nation of Israel. Where was Jesus crucified? On a cross on Mount Calvary. And where is that? In Israel. Where was He buried? In a tomb right outside of Jerusalem in Israel. 
Oh, listen, our roots as Christians go way back in. They go really deep. And when Jesus ascended to heaven, the last place His feet touched this planet were on the Mount of Olives, which is right just east of the city of Jerusalem in Israel. Does it matter? Yes. Here's the good part. Acts chapter 1, verse 11. They said, He's coming back. And he's going to, he said, they, they were two angels speaking to the disciples and said, As you have seen him go into heaven, he shall return in like manner. He's going to come back and his feet are going to touch that mountain, the same place he left from. And we just read the passage there in Zechariah 14 that the mountain's going to split half in two when he comes back. We need to pay attention to Israel. We need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the peace of Israel. Pray for the land that our Savior's coming back to. And if you're already saved, you're going to come back with Him. But what happens if you're not saved? If you're sitting here this morning and you have never trusted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, you're missing out. You're on the wrong side. And you'll have an eternity to regret it. Why don't you trust Jesus today? I've given you as much as I possibly can concerning what's going on over there in, in that land, but what about you and your relationship to Jesus? It's, that's really what matters. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord, here's your chance. I want to pray for you and pray with you. Heavenly Father, oh, thank you. I thank you that your word is always true and we can trust you, Father, completely. Every promise you've ever made, you made them way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all of the rest, and you've kept your word true. You promised that Jesus is going to rapture the church and take us away, and the tribulation period is going to come, and you promised that he's coming back again under the Mount of Olives, and it's going to split in two, and he's going to have a kingdom established for a thousand years of peace, and we know that's coming because your word is always true. The Father, as individuals, you promised if we would repent of our sins and trust Jesus as our Savior, if we would call on Him personally, one-on-one, -on -one, Jesus, please forgive me and save me, you promised He would do it. Your Word is always true. Oh, Father, if there's anybody here this morning that has never trusted you, they've never trusted your word, they never applied it to themselves, I pray that right now that's changing for them at this very moment. Let them know. They may need a lot of things, but they need Jesus more than anything else. You sent your son to a cross for them. He gave his life for them. So you can forgive them and count his punishment as payment in full for them. Oh, Father, if there's somebody here that's never trusted Jesus and been saved, I pray that this will be the moment of their salvation. Just help them to pray, Dear God, forgive me. Dear Jesus, come save me. I receive you as my Savior. Help them to pray, Dear Jesus, I give myself to you. Become my Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.